Hopefully by now, regular visitors to my channel will have learned that I love a broad range of role-playing games. For me, the tabletop prefix is unnecessary, as computer RPGs came after, and some of the games that I enjoy are quite niche and esoteric. Sure, Traveller remains my favourite, Dungeons & Dragons probably third in line. These games are established. Much of their current content is drawn from decades of previous. Take the upcoming Dungeons & Dragons anthology quests from the Infinite Staircase, which is to reiterate some, in 5e, some classics from older D&D editions, and the relatively recent Mongoose Traveller World Builder's Handbook, which draws from both the DGP Mega Traveller volume of the same name and the New Era World Tamer's Handbook, alongside its own innovations. But where the creativity is truly at, where the experimentation and capture of the spirit of the RPG hobby of my youth is in the independent sector. And I don't mean the indie publisher that pushes out yet another clone of their favourite D&D edition. I mean indie publishers who are attempting something new, or at least semi-new, for it is difficult in a creative arena that has a certain level of vintage to it uh, arrive at something completely original. Anyway, this brings me to the Agency of Narrative Intrigue and Mystery, or ANIM for short, and their new game, Eureka, which debuted on Kickstarter earlier this month. As of this writing, the Kickstarter is still in full swing, link in the description, along with a link to ANIM's website, from where a free quick start version of Eureka can be downloaded. In this video, I'll run through a loose breakdown of what Eureka is about, along with a review. While Anima provided me with a review copy to that end, as always, what follows are my own honest thoughts about the game. Eureka taglines itself as a game of investigative urban fantasy. And what exactly does that mean? Well, while I feel the inclusion of the word urban in that tagline suggests a limitation to cityscapes that doesn't exist within the game itself, investigative fantasy does hit the nail on the head. As would investigative horror, or investigative sci-fi, or investigative weird science, and any other investigative epithet that you wish to add. The key word is investigative. The premise of the game is this. The player characters take the role of detectives, professional or amateur, and avoiding the term investigator to detach the game from Call of Cthulhu. More on that in a later. These detectives are presented a mystery to solve. This may be a situation that must be worked through in order to figure out what is going on and potentially resolve the underlying problem. The game calls these types of mystery Kolchakian, after a TV series called Kolchak, the Night Stalker, which, despite the authors protesting that people under 50 probably hadn't heard of it, I am firmly over 50 and also haven't heard of it. A bit of googling reveals why. The show ran for one series of 20 episodes in the mid-1970s in the United States before being cancelled. Anyway, fortunately for the potential UK player of the game, there are equivalents, which I will go into further on, but for now, I'll leave it as saying that Kolchak was a big influence on the X-Files, so you should get a rough idea from that. The other suggested form is where the detectives are stuck, trapped or otherwise confined, and are potentially being stalked. Here, they might discover what is stalking them and how to defeat it. Therefore, part of the resolution of the mystery is to move from a position of prey to one of hunter, but also to survive and escape the confinement. This could be something so simple as a mysterious house with inexplicably locked doors, or a cruise vessel where the ocean forms a natural barrier, or a strange village where all roads out into the unmapped countryside always seem to lead back to the village itself. This form the game terms Pac-Manian, or Pac-Manian, after the video game Pac-Man, and his endless quest to defeat the ghosts in the maze. There are some similarities to Call of Cthulhu. Although Eureka is not specifically tied to horror, does not reference Lovecraft, and handles the process of investigation in a unique and innovative way. While the game references Kolchak, as noted, a TV series that remains a mystery to me, and cites The X-Files as an influence in the same way that TV show was influenced by Kolchak, I also see elements of The Avengers here. 
By this, I mean the original British Avengers TV series from the 1960s, John Steed and his companions, rather than the marginally later multicoloured superhumans. This show was of a similar Mystery of the Week type, and within its later series, those where Steed was joined by Emma Peel and Tara King, the horror, sci-fi and weird science elements fit right at home within the framework of the Eureka game. This is also probably a better frame of reference for us over 50s of a British upbringing. Influences for the Pacmanian style of play are cited as Alien, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Resident Evil, but I would also like to add the Avengers in here too, particularly the Emma Peel episode, The House That Jack Built. While the Eureka game presents itself as a dark setting, the premise of the rules loans the game to any kind of investigative play, with or without weird or horror elements. While I feel the authors might not want to admit it, a mystery based on Scooby-Doo would not feel out of place, and other unmentioned influences I can also bring to mind would include Sherlock Holmes, Doctor Who, Supernatural, Alice in Borderlands, Grimm, and any number of episodes of The Twilight Zone and The Outer Limits. Unlike many role-playing games, the concept put forward by Eureka is not to assemble a team of characters whose skills complement and interlock. In Dungeons & Dragons, for example, being a successful adventuring party often means presenting a wide span of skills, someone to be the mainstay of the fighting, someone to sort out those pesky traps and locks, someone to provide the magical artillery and general sorting out of arcane chicanery, and someone to glue all of the body parts back together again after the dust settles. No such requirement is placed on a group of players in Eureka. In fact, it is discouraged. Instead, players are encouraged to build personas, divorced from any arbitrary package of skills and abilities, such as classes or professions or careers and roles. Players are relatively free to pick their character's skills and traits, and provide for themselves whatever justification of the result is necessary to make sense of the numbers. Now, I am very much an advocate of classless systems, but often find at least some definition of context of roles helps with building a picture of the world in the players' minds, even if they're just perusing such options to get a sense of the sort of people their character might meet. This sort of world-building, though, isn't needed within Eureka, and I really do like the concept of build first, figure out the character's niche in the world after. The range of skills available run from actual capabilities, for example how good they are at driving or how much they know about a particular subject, to conceptual, such as wealth as a skill. Skills are direct modifiers to a two six-sided dice roll, with a ten or higher resulting in a full success, a result of seven to nine being a partial success and anything less than seven being a failure. Succeeding or failing carries consequences which are generally interpreted narratively by the, well, the, the game master role in Eureka is literally termed the narrator. Skills can be combined, where logical, for such checks. To create a character, pick a bunch of skills, assign modifiers to them that add up to a net of zero, and then pick three traits that provide additional modifiers and provide further definition of the character. There are options for selecting more traits by taking a hit during play, but we'll come to that. One novel feature of Eureka's skills is the inclusion of a redacted skill, or the blacked out skill, that appears as redacted text within the rules. This skill is roughly equivalent to Call of Cthulhu's Mythos skill, that is, it refers to the supernatural, the weird and the unexplained. Characters also possess tears of fear, that is, things the characters find scary, and to what degree. The tears run from horrific through to ridiculous. During play, characters may, or will, have to deal with scary situations and things, and how well they are keeping it together in the light of their plight is measured by composure. When exposed to such things, characters may need to make a composure check, which uses the character's tears of fear to determine a modifier for such a check. Things a character finds horrific will be harder for him to retain his composure when exposed to them, while things he finds ridiculous he will find easier to cope with. Failure of such checks result in loss of composure points, and the amount of composure points currently retained acts as a modifier cap for skill checks. Only two composure points remaining? Maximum plus two skill modifier for you. Before I go on to what I consider to be the meat and core of the system, I'll briefly touch on combat. 
Combat is skill-based, and therefore ties into the narrative use of full success, success and failure. Characters possess two health tracks, one for penetrative damage, knives, axes, talons and so on, and one for superficial damage, blunt trauma, punches, headbutts and the like. Skill results breed damage to one of these tracks, and when a track is reduced to a minimum, a check is made to determine injuries suffered, broadly in terms of incapacitation. Recovery from superficial damage and injury happens naturally, while recovery from penetrative damage and injury requires medical intervention. The combat and injury system also allows for grievous wounds, which in order to alleviate the effects of need more drastic intervention, for example the use of prosthetics with respect to grievous injuries to limbs. The combat system is fairly descriptive and full, but it is not a tactical style of skirmish that you would find, for example, in Dungeons and Dragons. This would be entirely unsuitable to the game's premise. In a role-playing game of largely narrative scope, it is difficult to strike a balance with something that can get quite involved as the subject of combat, injury and healing can be. Here, I don't think Anam have done a bad job, and the general combat system fits nicely. I think where the game goes off tack is with the inclusion of advanced combat rules, which for me break the immersion and start getting into fiddly bits of extended weapon statistics, minutiae of firearms use and so on. While the rules do give the option not to use these advanced rules, uh, I feel this would be a better inclusion in, say, a, a companion volume of options than within a core rulebook. Combat isn't the biggest draw of the game for me but is, with the advanced options included, the largest chunk of the rulebook, which suggests that it is a major focus of the game when the impression I get is that that isn't the intent. OK, combat done with. The core of play, and what I feel is the major focus of the game, lives within the investigative part of play, clues in the name. This is largely handled by narrative between players and narrator, with the narrator describing something, the environment, a room and so on, to the players, and the players deciding what to do with that description. This usually involves the players picking up on some element of the narrator's description, a point of interest, and examining it more closely to see if anything pertinent about the situation can be gleaned. Examining points of interest can lead to clues, the nature of which and how they themselves are to be examined by the character, going towards informing an investigation check. A skill check using the relevant skills to the examination's nature, to see what information the character may obtain. Narratively, the character gains information that may forward the overall investigation towards unravelling the mystery at hand. Mechanically, the character may gain investigation points. Once a number of investigation points have been acquired, and those players that opted to add more than the usual three traits to their characters require more investigation points to be accumulated than is otherwise the case, the character gains a Eureka point. Eureka points are a key mechanic. They can be used for all sorts of things, from enhancing skills and other roles and checks in the game, to having eureka moments, points of clarity where connections are made that were maybe hitherto missed when examining points of interest earlier in the investigation, or just coming up with some inspired piece of connective thinking. Now this mechanic I love. It encourages players to hunt for clues and make investigation roles because this is how they gain Eureka points, which in turn are used to keep the narrative of the mystery going forward. It works great within the Eureka system itself, but could be worked into games such as Call of Cthulhu to serve a similar purpose there. I will emphasise that Eureka and Call of Cthulhu have very different underlying themes to them. The nihilism and diminishing sanity with the increase of knowledge present in Cthulhu isn't within the scope of Eureka, for example. But as a drive for investigative play, I think it's great. One final thing to wrap up the play section. Eureka does cover a lot of ground when it comes to types of mystery, and a fair chunk of that, especially given its influence, sits within the realm of the supernatural. The rules do provide for supernatural entities and supernatural player characters. Um, the balance for characters that possess such additional powers is along the same lines as those previously mentioned for characters who take more than the usual allotment of three traits. That is, they need to accumulate more investigation points to acquire a Eureka point. 
Given how useful Eureka Points are to this flow and play of the game, this is more a disincentivizing element than a balancing one to me, whether intentional or not. But in a game where there are no levels or ability scores and similar statistical elements to play around with balancing, it's fine. Personally, if I was going to go down the supernatural character route, I'd probably do away with the increased investigation point requirement and just provide balance by everyone having some equivalent level of capability, be it supernatural powers or mundane characters with additional traits. And that is basically the system in a nutshell. The narrator is there to narrate the results of player character actions alongside the usual duties of playing every other persona in the game that isn't controlled by a player, and the players themselves drive the story forward within the framework of the mystery presented to them through the actions of their characters. In this way, Eureka is very much more player-led than most role-playing games. One thing I can't do so much at this point is review the layout of the game's rulebooks, as, with the Kickstarter still running and the design still in progress, all I have to go on is the aesthetic sampling provided to reviewers. But from that, it's fitting and reminiscent of pinboards, of miles of string connecting clues which, by the end of a decent mystery, the player's notes are going to resemble. The rules themselves are pretty comprehensive, and I feel go further than the game's concept actually requires. For example, my previous comments on the advanced combat rules. The book does a nice job of explaining the game's concepts ahead of delving into character creation, and I think it is a good philosophy for rulebooks to use. Many rulebooks, after a short introduction, dive straight into character creation, leaving players working with attributes and stats before they fully understand what they mean. Eureka provides enough information in its opening chapter to set the scene, describe the general mode of play, and enough of the rule concepts ahead of the character creation chapter, without getting bogged down in presenting the rules wholesale. It takes a few more pages to achieve it, but is, I feel, worthwhile. Investigative role-playing is one of my favourite forms of play, be it more as a mental exercise as per the Consulting Detective series of games, investigation on the edge as in Call of Cthulhu, or as a subgenre with any major setting from fantasy through to science fiction. Eureka joins the small pantheon of games where investigative play is a focus, with some very nice mechanics for managing player-driven mystery-solving narratives. I also love games that fire the experimentative side of me, and Eureka does just that. Obviously, I want to see how it works within a, an Avengers type of universe, and I suspect better than Agents of Swing or 1960s Spycraft, which have a more traditional role-playing approach to investigative play. I want to see how it might mash with the collaborative Game Masterless framework put forward by Western City. With the system of player contribution and vetoes that provides, coupled with a narrative results of Eureka's dice checks, something that is quite a lot of fun to play might evolve. Anyway, we shall see. For the time being, check out Anim's Kickstarter for Eureka Investigative Urban Fantasy. Sign up for it if this review and what you find there appeals, and give this intriguing indie RPG a fly. It's a lot of fun.